appreciate that. So today we have come together um, to talk about something in some ways very elementary, uh, but also something quite complex. And that is the meaning of the terms race and ethnicity. Now, um, we decided to do this in a special way, which is to bring together some of our um, CCSRE affiliated faculty who have played various roles at the center over the last 20 years. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year, really pleased about that. Um, to bring them together to speak from their own disciplinary perspectives about how they understand these terms. Now, um, they may speak about both terms, they may choose to focus on the term race. Uh, it is our uh, understanding uh, that, uh, that these terms sometimes are used as a matter of course, but people have different understandings of what they're talking about while they're doing so. And while they, it, it's not completely constrained by discipline, it is often very inflected by discipline. Um, uh, all of these people have been working in interdisciplinary contexts for a long time, and so their uh, understanding of, of these terms may be more, may have been very much influenced by that uh, experience. But um, we'll find out what they have to say. Uh, this was just something that I thought, you know, wait, let's just get uh, some people together and just get down to the basics and see what comes out of that. I'm really thrilled to see so many of you here. Um, I, this is especially at a time like now where issues of race and ethnicity are so central to what is happening in our uh, current political uh, situation. And we need to have a clearer, more, uh, a clearer understanding of what we're facing and what we're talking about when we use these terms. And so without further ado, what I'm going to do now is introduce our four speakers. I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them. Uh, I'm more interested in hearing what they have to say. And um, I'm not, so we'll do that. We'll hear from each of them. I ask them to provide a six to eight minute opening gambit. Um, they've all looked at me like I'm crazy, but I am going to set a clock, and when eight minutes comes, it's going off, and uh, that will at least tell everybody here that they have taken their eight, ten minutes. The point of this is to get that out there so that we can open the conversation and involve you all. So if we don't do that, we'll never get to the, the discussion, which we'd like to get to. So um, uh, first, I will introduce uh, Professor Matt Smith. He is the Burnett C. and Mildred Finley Walford Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences in the Department of Sociology. Uh, he is Senior Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity, and he is our immediate past director of the Center for Comparative Studies and Race and Ethnicity. He has served in that uh, capacity a couple of times, so um, welcome, Matt. Following him will be uh, Professor Sylvia Yanagisako, who is the Edward Clark Crossett Professor of Humanistic Studies in the Department of Anthropology. Um, Sylvia's work has been very important to me in understanding um, these issues uh, over the course of the years, and I'm really pleased to have her here with us. Um, next will be one of our newer colleagues, who I'm just thrilled to death has joined us here in CCSRE and at Stanford, and that is Jonathan Rosa, who is Assistant Professor of Education and Anthropology and Linguistics by Courtesy. So welcome, Jonathan. Really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And um, last but certainly not least is my dear colleague, um, Professor Jennifer Devere Brody. Jennifer is Professor of Theater and Performance Studies, and she is the current director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. And let me just say, I am so enjoying uh, the experience of working with Jennifer. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Matt. Okay, well thank you, Paula. Um, the framing questions that Paula sent to us uh, to cover, be covered in eight minutes, had to, went along the lines of what is race and what is ethnicity and how are they similar or different? And, you know, when I looked at that, you know, I, my, and my, my initial reaction anyway to the efforts to try to define uh, race and ethnicity is that it's largely a fool's errand, but Paula thought I was up to the task, so here I go. Um, so what I'm going to do in the few minutes that I have, is uh, talk a bit about, I'll give you a thumbnail sketch 
of race and ethnicity as they've sort of come down within particularly the discipline of sociology, and I'll uh, let Sylvia talk about anthro. But, uh, and then sort of say, um, I'll get sort of the, the punchline is with regard to what race, how, the, how race and ethnicity are similar or different, is that, you know, I would argue that there's no difference whatsoever. And if I have time today, that I'll share with you uh, a way of thinking about race that most of my colleagues in sociology don't think about race and um, probably would, would find something to disagree about. We can, we can deal with that later. Um, race, as we understand it, is, is a scientific concept that emerged out of natural philosophy in the uh, late 18th century uh, with uh, scholars like uh, Carl Linnaeus, uh, Friedrich von Blumenbach, and it began with an effort to basically create a set of taxonomic categories uh, for classifying the different types of human beings that were out there in the world. And then what grew up around that in the 19th century was what we think of as the racial sciences, which was rooted within the um, evolution of biology and the sort of development of biology as a distinct science apart from philosophy. And what grew up around that was this body of knowledge of what we think of as the racial sciences. And, of course, race was a, a sort of the centerpiece of all of that work. And then coming into the 20th century, uh, that work continued uh, almost unabated, and particularly the effort to create a set of taxonomic categories for the numbers of races that there were out in the world. Uh, and there were all sorts of different estimates and different approaches to doing it. And that project more or less ended uh, with the Human Genome Project, uh, which Luca Cavalli Sforza uh, famously said that there are about as many races as there are people in the world. Um, and then sort of a few years after that, uh, Neil Risch, a geneticist up at uh, UC San Francisco, sort of reignited uh, the controversy by coming up with this notion of using uh, segments of uh, DNA to talk about uh, continental origins. Now, in the social sciences, and particularly sociology, uh, which sort of really came onto the scene in the late 19th century, uh, a number of scholars took up uh, the, the subject of what race is. And in an effort to try to, to, to define race in, in a way that was, in a sense, consistent with the biological sciences, but you know, added some uniquely social dimension to it, you began to see all sorts of tortured explanations about um, other kinds of features of race besides simple biology. And so there were dimensions of power, there was, you know, there were not relations of domination and subordination, there were sort of histories of oppression and, and various other sorts of things that became embroidered over that. And then over the course of the uh, 20th century, these uh, definitions proliferated to the extent that, um, uh, to the extent that it became, you know, uh, it's like a Tower of Babel uh, that, you know, really nobody could agree. There's no consensus about what race was. You know, there's something about biology and something about oppression and, and whatever else. Uh, so in the early 1960s, there were two sociologists, uh, uh, Milton Younger and George Simpson, who did something that I thought was quite clever. And they said, we're not going to define race, but we will talk about types of racial definitions. And they 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 outlined three basic types. One was what they call mystical, which, you know, were Basically, notions of race rooted in folklore, the most infamous would be the, the Nazis uh, and their, their notion of an Aryan super race. But they, the two that they thought were you know, really appropriate for scientific inquiry was, were biological definitions, which you know, basically consisted of a homogeneous gene pool, and then uh, administrative definitions. And these are the ones that we're probably most familiar with. These are the things that show up on uh, college applications, scholarship forms, job applications, they're things that governments proliferate for the purposes of monitoring and surveillance certain kinds of groups in their society. How many do we have? I use that three minutes. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, those are, so you know, those are sort of the three kinds of definitions and, you know, and, and so, you know, uh, sociologists uh, continue to struggle with these. There's a a uh, book by uh, Steve Cornell and Doug Hartman that came out a few years ago about uh, uh, identity, racial and ethnic identity, and they have a long chapter at the beginning uh, to talk about race and ethnicity. Um, but sort of that grew up along along these lines was that, and also in the, the early 19th, early 20th century, um, 
we began to see the, this term ethnicity you, you know, begin to appear in the literature. In fact, Max Weber in Economy and Society, which was published in 1922, was probably the most famous treatment of it, but other people have picked it up along the way. Um, and you know, ethnicity was proposed as, a, as a, another way of thinking about human difference that was based on social and cultural characteristics. And in the 1980s, we have the Harvard Encyclopedia of American Ethnic Groups that listed about 40 some odd different characteristics that were the hallmarks of ethnicity. Uh, Friedrich Barth said that you know, the hallmark of ethnicity was mutual, rec uh, mutual self recognition. And so we've had ethnicity that's sort of grown up on the side and kind of the naive version sort of contrasts race as biology and eth ethnicity as, as, as culture and, and, and social behavior. And I really think of ethnicity as being essentially a strategic discourse that people used as a way of trying to come up with another way of thinking about human difference besides simply physical differences. And that, you know, to try in the early 20th century to talk about race as being something other than biology was essentially trying to overturn uh, a century of scientific thought and conventional wisdom. And so ethnicity presented an opportunity to, in a sense, uh, engage in another line of thinking, another line of dialogue. But at the end of the day, and like I said, I, I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop in a second. I want to suggest to you that there's no difference whatsoever between race and ethnicity, uh, and that it's a false dichotomy. And the very fact that you know, we use these two terms interchangeably or always together, uh, I think suggests that there is a fundamental com uh, confusion in the scientific literature as well as the public understanding of these two ideas. Thank you, Matt. I, I really appreciate your laying down a very clear thing that we can start to agree with or disagree with. Um, so we will move on to Sylvia. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I'm going to start with race and probably spend more time on race than on ethnicity because as Matt has already pointed out, anthropology has a very um, intimate history of its relationship to this concept. Indeed, the formation of anthropology as a discipline is inextricably tied to the concept of race. Right? But let me start by defining race in a slightly different way uh, than Matt has. I'll, I'm going to define race as the hierarchy of ranked categories segmenting the human population that was developed by Western Europeans as they engaged in global expansion beginning in the 15th century. Okay. So obviously what I'm, em I'm emphasizing here is the importance of historicizing the concept of race, treating it not as a universal concept, but as one that emerged in a very specific historical um, uh, political history, namely the history of European imperialism from the 15th century to the present. Now, I can anticipate somebody's going to say, but you know, there are other people around the world who have all these ideas about racial difference and even hierarchy, which is fine. We should talk about that. But I want to say that those are not necessarily the same as the concept of race that I'm going to talk about here today. So um, Matt has already said a few things about the emergence of this concept of race. I just want to add a couple of things to that uh, history. And that is that um, I think it's important to keep in mind that when the, the um, concept of race really began to uh, be talked about in Europe in about the 17th and 18th centuries, it was actually initially used as a kind of loose category. It was just a very sloppy way of talking about differences that people observed in uh, people throughout the world. Um, and obviously it emerged in this period, um, especially because of European expansion, right? Um, but it's in the 19th century um, that you start to get these uh, much more systematic attempts to define or, or identify the criterion or criteria by which these different human groups could be identified. And it's in that debate, and uh, it's a very complex and interesting debate in the 19th century, including you know, as, as whether or not these races are come from one origin or whether they're actually different human species, right? You have polygenous and monogenous. And so there's a really interesting debate in the 19th century over this. It's in that debate that anthropology emerges as a discipline to answer the question of how do we, in fact, differentiate these different human groupings? Now, there's a, so there's a long history here where anthropologists argue about all of this. Obviously, Darwinian evolutionary theory in the 19th century has a huge impact on this debate. And it's with Dar Darwinian evolutionary theory that anthropologists began to not only 
think about races as geographically distinct groups, but they also begin to locate those differences in an evolutionary hierarchy. <coughs> so that's the science of race that comes out of the 19th century, the anthropology of race, is an attempt to try to match what we, the so-called observable differences between human groupings with an evolutionary scheme, and that's how you get this hierarchy of races with the idea that some races are closer to our earlier ancestors, the apes, right? So that's very much the science of race, and which anthropologists today would call scientific racism. But that's the science out of which race uh, um, as a, an anthropology emerged in the late 20th century. What happened in that period, and I think it's really important to keep in mind, that what anthropologists did in the 19th century was they transformed a really loose phenomenological set of categories, a classification system, into what they thought was an actual science of race. They got so involved in trying to identify the criteria or criterion by which you could differentiate groups from each other that they forgot that in fact they weren't even sure what that difference was, right? And so they began to develop a kind of essentialist view of race which assumed that these observable differences and the groupings actually said something very, very deeply significant about these groups of people. By the 20th century, as Matt has pointed out, anthropologists and sociologists have moved past that. Not only did we um, anthropologists reject the hierarchy of races, but by mid 20th century, anthropologists have rejected the concept of race itself. In other words, rejecting the idea that there are these empirically um, segmented groups that you can, that are stable racial groups throughout the world. And, and we can go into the complicated discussions of that and it gets very, very uh, complex, especially recently when you start to have more genetic evidence. Um, but I just wanna point out that um, the anthropology really in the 20th century is founded, modern anthropology was founded on the notion of the difference between race, language, and culture. The idea that race, is somehow a set of physical characteristics, whether they're inherited or not, and what they have to do, uh, what they mean is one thing, but that culture and language were clearly not biologically inherited, but they were actually learned through socialization. That notion of learning through socialization is central to the concept of ethnicity that emerged and became much more prevalent in the 20th century. I agree with Matt entirely that ethnicity becomes uh, central, mainly because people are trying to find a different way to talk about differences and they can't, they're trying to get away from race. So the fact that ethnicity emerges really as a big uh, topic in the uh, post-World War II era, I think is um, obvious that it's related to shifts in, certainly in the U.S., in people's consciousness about uh, the problematic status of the concept of race. So ethnicity becomes a, a dominant paradigm in which people are trying to talk about differences between social groups that are based on so-called learned characteristics of culture, language, cultural values, uh, and also the assumption that somehow these people form communities of interaction with some sense of shared, sense of shared identity. Okay. Uh, what's problematic about that concept of ethnicity is that it often got used and is still used by some people um, in a way that assumes that people are somehow born into these kinds of communities, that they simply, through uh, being brought up in families, absorb certain kinds of cultural values and shared identities. Um, and what's happened more recently, I think, in the last 30 years or so, is that both anthropologists and sociologists have begun to realize that it's much more complicated than that, uh, and that it's not simply a matter of being brought up in a community, but rather that there are very um, specific processes of inclusion and exclusion by which ethnic boundaries are maintained and reinforced. And so we have to understand this as not only a social construction, but we have to look at the way in which specific political histories are, um, uh, are central to the way in which these groups are formed and to the way in which people identify with them. So the distinction then would seem to be, as Matt points out to some people, the difference between biology and culture. But in fact, 
while I think it's useful to analytically separate those two concepts, and I still think it's, it's useful. I mean, I guess I would argue with Matt and say, I think it's analytically useful to make that separation. What we can't do is forget that people don't use the terms that way, right? So that in terms of, what, of how we try to understand race and ethnicity out there in the world, we have to look at what it is that people actually are saying and how they think about these terms and how that shapes their action. Because I don't think most people analytically separate those, uh, those concepts. And I think our recent uh, you know, rhetoric, anti-immigration rhetoric, makes that absolutely clear. That while religion would seem to be part of culture and seem to be something that's learned, the way in which it's treated in a lot of rhetoric is as if it's something that is ingrained in people's bodies. Jonathan. Okay, well, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to share with you all today and be in conversation. I should say that when I got this invitation, I said, oh, wow, we're going to have this battle during my second quarter in residence on faculty. <laughs> because this is what I fight about all day long. What's your theory of race? Does it just exist in the world? What's your theory of difference, of boundaries, of differentiation? Are these categories always already constituted, or do we have to demonstrate how they come to be constituted? And what I find, more often than not, is that the categories are always already in place, that the bodies, it's a body-based referent for what, the, for what race means, and then we'll talk about that in relation to ethnicity in a moment. But uh, I'll get into it in relation to my training, both as an anthropologist, but also in terms of linguistics and education, and then in race and ethnic studies in, you know, three minutes or something. And I'll say why, and a, a definition of these concepts is problematic, and then of course I'll pose a definition of these concepts, <laughs> and then you know we'll see what we can do with all of that. So um, to follow up on some of Sylvia's comments, just in terms of anthropology, I wanted to think about the attempt, the anthropological attempt, to overcome its racist history by investing in ethnicity as a concept rather than race, um, so that ethnicity is presented as a straightforward cultural sort of referent. Race is problematic. You talk about race within anthropology, often you have to put it in scare, scare quotes. And the idea is that race is socially constructed, which then leaves ethnicity as just existing somehow, or more naturally um, already in existence, or somehow less problematically in existence. So this notion that social construction somehow allows us to overcome the problematic definition of race still ultimately re relies on a biological reference. So what is it that's being socially constructed? Bodies, ultimately. So it doesn't have, as Sylvia was suggesting, it doesn't have a historical or a political kind of analysis of what, social, what is being socially constructed. Um, so that's one of the, the issues that we would want to figure out um, in terms of what's happening with race and anthropology. What does social construction mean? Does it help us to get anywhere? Brackett Williams help us, helps us to get places in terms of her um, brilliant analysis of the relationship between race, ethnicity, and class in Guyana and elsewhere. Um, in terms of linguistics, also a racist history. That'll be a theme for the day. You know, the European intellectual project is racist, just largely. Uh, so um, linguistics, whether we're talking about the history of Americanist linguistics, field linguistics, which is rooted um, in a, a, a Bloomfieldian project of looking at indigenous communities and framing certain, famously Bloomfield said about White Thunder and indig um, Menominee Man, uh, he could be said to speak no language tolerably. The notion that certain populations are without culture, are ultimately without these practices that would constitute them as legitimate uh, humans. Um, of course, the Chomsky-inspired version of linguistics has attempted to overcome this racist history by rooting the discipline in cognitive science, so thus a humanist project of saying, so that uh, a universalist humanist project of saying what language is, so all languages are ultimately fundamentally equal, they all have the same underlying structures. Um, of course, humanism is not a way of escaping racism because the referent for what a human is in this kind of intellectual project is normative whiteness, uh, European-oriented whiteness. We want to think about whether humanis uh, humanism gets us very far. Sociolinguists have done amazing work um, by trying to sort of carve out an alternative project and looking at the ways that racially stigmatizing views of particular language practices and varieties ultimately misunderstand the nature of those practices. So sociolinguistics has largely been invested in many cases of demonstrating the rule-governed systematic nature of various populations' practices even if they are viewed from um, many perspectives as deficient or somehow in need of remediation. Um, in education, scholars have looked at structural reproduction of the structural reproduction of um, racial inequality, even insofar as racial inequality has been um, erased from the law. So juridically, we might have racial inclusion or equality, but we still see long-standing patterns. So uh, scholars of education 
help, helped us to understand the nature of those patterns, how to document them, um, but also helped us to understand socialization and the emergence or socialization to racial and ethnic uh, identities. However, within, uh, well, we should say about education's own fraught history with racism, right? So definition of, well, this campus, in terms of education, the definition of what intelligence is, of what an IQ is, of the ways that we demonstrate what knowledge is, legitimate forms of knowledge, or this kind of thing. Um, so more recent work has tried to overcome that. Um, but the, the idea is that in terms of these kinds of measures of structural inequality, there are things, there are racialized bodies and practices that are already in existence or understood as being in existence that can then be measured such that we can now document racial inequity or inequality, however one might want to construe it, by, by, um, by observing those kinds of practices. So I want to wonder, I, I want to think about an alternative approach. So to follow up on Sylvia's kind of approach, what would a racial or a colonial constitution of race thesis look like um, that points to particular historical, historical and political moments. So Barner Hesse says uh, in his constitutional colonial, uh, consti colonial constitution of race thesis, um, race is not in the eye of the beholder or on the body of the objectified, but rather an inherited Western modern colonial practice of violence, assemblage, superordination, exploitation, and segregation, demarcating the colonial rule of Europe over non-Europe. And to the extent that that rule or the reproduction of that rule is what, how we might want to understand race, and Barner Hesse is um, who I'm pointing to in this definition, we already have then an intersectional and assemblage-based approach to this, um, this kind of a concept. So this involves the reproduction, so through normative gender and sexual roles, the reproduction and, and governance through uh, normative class um, relations in very particular ways, and um, normative definitions of ideal citizen, citizen subjectivity as well as abject others in relation to those ideals. So to follow up on Matt, uh, we might borrow from um, Silvio Torres Sayan, who uses an ethno-racial frame, so you can't divorce race and ethnicity. They always have to go together. We might borrow from Bonnie Urcioli, who suggests that race and ethnicity are about different ways of being positioned in relation to the nation, so that ethnicity is an imagined um, approximation of uh, national inclusion or the embodiment of ideal citizenness or citizenship. Um, and race would be the embodiment of an imagined exclusion or abject otherness, hence no matter how long certain bodies have been in certain places, and I know Jennifer's going to talk about this, uh, they are always imagined as being from elsewhere, as embodying an elsewhere. So that's that ethno-racial kind of um, perspective. Um, in my work, which looks at uh, race, language, and the creation of Latinx identities, I always grapple with these issues because of the ways people say, oh yes, Latinx is a, that's an ethnicity, not a, not a race. As though every other group were actually a race, right? So Asian were just a race, as though black were a race, as though white were a race, as though Latinx were somehow more constructed or more heterogeneous internally than any of these other categories. So we have to think about problematically, you know, the problematic nature of some of these claims and, and what our investments are. In terms of the stakes of the conversation and what I have, uh, like. 45 seconds to say that. Um, the stakes of the conversation for me are uh, involved on the one hand, um, our understandings of power, and on the other, our theories of change. So our inability to grapple with um, the US as, say, a settler colonial and thus inherently racist society allows us to imagine <coughs> this contemporary moment is somehow new and emergent. This is settler, a settler colony, right? So, so Donald Trump didn't come from nowhere. He's non-exceptional. We have to non-exceptionalize him, and we have to deprovincialize him to understand him in relation to the global relations. Um, in terms of theories of change, we can't keep trying to prove following Toni Morrison and others who have been saying these things for years. Or let me just quote Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, who says, but I don't want equal rights with a white man. If I did, I'd be a thief and a murderer, right? So the idea is that our vision of change can't simply be equality uh, on uh, existing terms which always deny the humanity of certain populations. Being included in an existing system, or diversity and inclusion, into an existing system is not a theory of change because it misunderstands the nature of power and the nature of the problem. Is that even? Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, it is such an honor to be here. I am so excited and looking forward to talking with you. And um, allow me, uh, because I did write out my remarks, um, to reiterate some of the comments and uh, excellent critiques already offered <coughs> by my distinguished colleagues. So I majored in Victorian studies, uh, which is to say the 19th century, and I 
where I witnessed ideas about race hardening as the century progressed, especially in conjunction with the professionalization of the sciences, and therefore what was the space of a blackness in that, despite the fact that historically, uh, Frederick Douglass, um, so many former slaves are lobbying for abolition in England, um, and that there was then a kind of invention of whiteness, uh, the special relationship that's been in the recent news of uh, looking at a former colonial power uh, and its descendants, if you will. Here I'm talking about the development of an inter international understanding of whiteness as a racial category. Um, and it was interesting that the academy itself perpetuated certain ideas about which bodies could study particular kinds of work. And you'll see where I'm going with that in a minute. Um, so defining race, as Sylvia said, uh, the etymology of the term dates back to the voyages of discovery, uh, the invention of settler colonialism begun in the 15th century. This proverbial age of expansion from Europe, when well, that's important, um, uh, which was also the era of domination of indigenous populations and the rise of capitalism, to say nothing of the spread of Christianity. According to David Goldberg, the earliest use of the term race in English comes from a poem, as in its linguistic construction, by William Dunbar in 1508. This term is a cognate with the idea of root, as in vegetables, and indeed national maps have played a part in concretizing the idea <clears throat> of population diversity and dispersal. The word is bound up inexorably with modernity, with uh, the Western Enlightenment, and the scholastic obsession with classification um, from Aristotle all the way up through the Enlightenment <coughs> investment in taxonomy that Matt mentioned, which helped to reproduce the racial contract, um, the possessive investment in whiteness and property bodies as the only bearers of right, <laughs> and I think as you were saying, the uh, idealized notion of the human. The scholar Jack Forbes, in his book on African and Native Americans, does a fine job of revealing these tangled skeins of classification, which we, I think, in many ways are still laboring to um, uh, understand. And I know Matt has also done a lot of great work on the census, which, of course, changes and shows historically um, the political understanding and the historicization of these categories that we sometimes um, use <coughs> Uh, inaccurately. So uh, this next section is called out of place. Race uh, are a contested term, and of course I too am not dealing with ethnicity, and I think that's very fascinating for similar reasons as my colleagues here, retains its performative power through its continual reconstructions and revisions. Created in legal, medical, political, scientific, common sense, and cultural discourses which do not cohere. This is to say that racial formation, um, according to Omi and Wanant, if not Beyonce, um, <laughs> relies upon specific kinds of racial scripts and schemas uh, that if you took the same body, and, and my uh, promiscuous post-discipline of performance studies, uh, like anthropology, is focused on um, the idea of bodies as bearers, a body-based kind of referent, right? That the same body um, would not necessarily parse racially, depending on which of the disciplinary and discursive lenses um, that we use to produce it, okay? Um, so, one popular racial logic, right, that sought to preserve racial purity and health was proffered by an international group of scholars at the turn of the century. And I think it's something that uh, comes right in between Matt's particular schema. So the end of the late 19th century, the development of anthropology, all the way forward um, to Ashley Montague, say, in the 50s and the kind of change. But what happened in there was very interesting. And it's something that bears a, a reference to Stanford. These international group of scholars alluded to here were white men known as eugenicists, the term coined by Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton, to index hereditary traits that could be, uh, in their view, manipulated to benefit society such that only the fittest, read white, racial specimens survived. A major proponent of, of eugenics was marine biologist and former Stanford University professor David Starr Jordan. In 1903, Jordan founded the American Breeders Associate Association that promoted ideas of <coughs> racial purity and argued against the mongrelization of the white race through the degenerate mixing 
Um, the American Breeders Association was funded by wealthy capitalists such as Leland Stanford, John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, uh, Kellogg, among others, and it sought to regulate women's sexual reproduction and establish research centers to collect data um, on fit and unfit breeders. Places such as Cold Spring Harbor Records Office in Michigan, founded in 1910, the ERO, gathered data, photographs, uh, measurements that throughout the 30s um, gave fellowships and spurned the field of genetics. Uh, spurred, sorry. It offered fellowships for scientists from the Third Reich, and in 1912, Jordan led the American delegation to the first International Eugenics Congress in London, where the ABA, the American Breeding Association, became the American Genetics Association, which published the journal Heredity, leading, lending magisterial credence to the idea of systematic breeding. My, uh, field and performance studies would very much argue against these kinds of essentialized understandings of race, looking at race instead as a doing and a thing done, to quote Ellen Diamond, uh, as something interactive, discursively, and material reproduced as twice restored behavior. As such, ra race is never fixed in bodies, but rather fixed onto them. It is not essence, but rather a matter of projection, interpolation, contestation, and, and negotiation, as well as material questions around inheritance, which I mean by that um, literal property. And I'll have, I can say something more about that in a minute. Um, let me give, though, a very quick example of the ways in which race is performative and, and is a matter of interpolation. Um, so, former MTL grad student, poet, and hip hop artist um, from the gay hip hop group Deep Dick Collective, love that title, um, Tim M. West tells a story of being in Brooklyn in the 1990s when he wore his hair in dreads. And uh, he turned around and heard a group of white appearing folks kind of catcalling him and calling him out as Jamaican. And he started to turn around and tell them that, in fact, he was from. Arkansas, but he realized that they were raising their sticks. Uh, this is the moment of sort of Crown Heights that Anna DeVere Smith has talked about. And he said his Jamaican ASS just had to run. Um, right, so that our race is not necessarily our own. It's about these light of long-standing understandings of perception of the ways in which um, we think we have these categories that we deploy for questions of power. Um, similarly, when I was alluding to earlier, the ways in which race or the similar biology or b body could be interpolated differently, even in an era before genetics, in apartheid South Africa, if a pencil stayed in your hair in court, you could be classified as black. The rule of hypodescent dependent upon the lie of black or white blood. In uh, Papa Doc Duvalier's um, Haiti, the idea that uh, if you had one drop of white blood, you would be classified as white, was had its corollary in our own country, where one drop of black blood made you black. This rule of hypo-descent uh, uh, was not overturned until the 1980s in New Orleans with the Susie Phipps case. Um, and uh, like Trevor Noah, I myself was born a crime, not in South Africa, but right here in the United States, <laughs> pre-1967, which was the Loving case versus Virginia, which ended miscegenation. Uh -huh. Um, so this question of uh, who could marry and uh, w it was something that happened in California. There was always the rule to try to preserve whiteness as a racial category. And so a lot of my uh, intellectual work has been looking at the invention of whiteness through things like using peroxide in your hair to be hyper white or David Duke, for example, who uses hair dye and has had plastic surgery to appeal to a kind of idealized uh, notion of what of whiteness, and it's just really important to remember um, when I was talking about inheritance and property that under slavery, someone like say Thomas Jefferson, who had slaves, could be the progenitor of a black chattel personal of a slave, but that was not a father, right? And then if you look at the rules of inheritance, uh, one of the consequences, despite the fact being of race being socially constructed, right, is that it left out a particular. Uh, property understandings of wealth. And in this country, property rights have often been protected over civil rights. Mm -hmm. And so that's the issue with merely saying now we are all whatever, right, is that we have a history which has a uh, possessive investment in whiteness. Okay, um, Jennifer. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was such a good ending. Thank you.
Okay, so as you can see, um, this is just an incredible amount of, uh, of insight and information that has been laid uh, in front of us here. And I know that each one of these um, scholars has more to say that I hope will come out in the conversation. So what I'd like to do now is to give the four scholars a chance to maybe uh, pick up on or question, maybe pose a question to each other. And if not, so we'll see. Yeah? Go in order. Or? Uh, just go ahead. Just go ahead and. Um, okay. Well, two two things that came out uh, I thought was that sort of was interesting. Um, one was Jonathan's comment about Latinx being an ethnicity, uh, and no one else is, and that <laughs> that the, the origins of that idea can be traced back to something called the Office of Management and Budget Directive <laughs> Number 15, as it was <laughs> issued in 1977. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but that's sort of, that's, that's one of the ways that race and ethnicity come to be understood and created is through what um, agencies like the federal government and other actors who are presumed to be authoritative, employers, scholarship givers, whatever, uh, the way they construct race is it becomes a racial cosmology for all the, for all the rest of us. Uh, mm -hmm. And sort of along the same lines was the sort of Jennifer's comments about hypodescent. And I think it's important to understand that hypodescent also had a very, um, ha after, you know, emerged after the end of the Civil War as a way of enlarging and, and, and bounding uh, a subordinate population that the, that the, the white planter class uh, needed to retain uh, for, for, for farm labor. Mm -hmm. uh, American Indians, on the other hand, have exactly the opposite rule. Mm -hmm. And then instead of hypodescent, you have hyperdescent, yep. and that comes from a ruling that was uh, uh, passed in 1933 by the Board of Indian Commissioners. Mm -hmm. And the commissioner said, we've got too many people collecting benefits <laughs> from the federal government. Uh, we need to uh, limit our liability. And what we're going to do is we're going to make one quarter as the minimum amount of blood that you have to have in order to qualify benefit for benefits from the federal government. Now, hypodescent, that, where that comes from is a little harder to, to define. But in the case of hyperdescent for American Indians, it's documented. We have a smoking gun. And we know exactly why uh, that rule was put into place. Thank you. Any of the other three of you have anything you want to pick up on? OK, what I'd like to do now, then, um, <clears throat> to bring more voices into the conversation is um, open it up to the floor and maybe collect three comments before we turn back to the panel as a way of, um, you know, getting more people on. So, Paula, can I actually say one yes, thing? I'm sorry. Wait, wait. <laughs> While he's saying something, you be thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two things I, w I wanted to pick up on based on everyone's comments. So. Um, first, this issue of hyperdescent versus hypo, hypodescent, which we might just frame as different racial logics. I just wanted to talk about the importance of understanding racial logics multiply, rather than simply thinking that there's one way that race works. Um, and I often worry about kind of the spectrum-based analysis of race or presumption about race, that you have people who are more and less racialized, and that's an objective fact about those persons or those categories. And rather, a historical or political analysis of race would want to understand why particular populations get framed racially in particular ways in particular moments. And it's based on th the inability to see that as or see beyond a spectrum-based analysis that we can't imagine why Muslims are positioned in this way in this moment, um, why various populations have been positioned in different ways. And we end up thinking, misunderstanding the, ex uh, the reasons why, for example, Dominicans identify racially the way that we do. And we pathologize particular groups rather than pathologizing the colonial histories that position groups in certain ways. Um, and the other point, very quickly, is I just wanted to pick up on the tension between viewing race as performed um, and viewing race from a, a historical kind of colonial perspective. And I'm interested in questions about performativity or the performativity of race, but also the ways in which the performativity of race can be deeply misleading. Um, so the notion that race lives in, in our recognition of self and other versus living in historical subject positions. Um, the idea that if one is identified in a particular way, in a particular space, that that's what constitutes them racially, rather than thinking about historically how certain categories have positioned populations. Um, so just wanted to pick up on that kind that's of. That's a, a great um, 
illuminating of attention, which I think could be spent, we could spend, you know, a whole hours sort of working that through. Did you want to say something? Yeah, no, I just want to say, I actually agree with you th with that. I was trying to show the contingency of race, but mm. the very idea of the categories we have to work with, as yeah. with gender, as Judith Butler has pointed out, is something that is already prescribed yeah. and therefore not about you know, a, a certain kind of choice or agency and that, um, yeah. it, they, that these terms also change, like how the Irish became white or yes. when uh, particular nations uh, and laws and other kinds of things need to frame difference, often for material gains. So I actually agree with you on that. Thank you. So, thoughts? Oh, come on. <laughs> yes. Can you just say your well, name I'm, and, I'm yeah. Cheryl Brown, I'm the Associate Director for African and American Studies, and so I, I appreciate everything that you're saying, and I'm, I actually really admire how much you were able to talk, and you talk me so fast, and I understand why. I was like, okay, we can't write down all these scholars. Um, but I, I think a lot about how students are identifying and how they fit within this, and then also the tension between nationality in this conversation and how that maps on to people who I think understand they need to identify with the race, but the you know, race, the race is stuck here, mm. doesn't fit onto their nationality. So anyone has anything to kind of say about that, their first generation or their second generation. Um, and then also, my children are young, eight and nine and, nine and 11, and asking these questions, and I'm trying to figure out how, in five minutes on the way to school, I can say what you just said in a way that makes sense to them, because I feel like a lot of times as parents, we're either reinforcing kind of the rhetoric that's out there by just saying, oh, this is kind of the sign of quickly for students, but how do we unpack that for them while acknowledging that they live in a system that is is defining it, but also helping them kind of challenge the ways that you have. So, so for the rest of you who may not have heard that question, so one of them uh, was about nationality and generation, different generation, first, second, third generation, and the other uh, question had to do with how do you talk about, how do you talk to young children about race in a, a way that they can understand without simply reinforcing uh, sort of uh, common ideas about race. So anybody else want to put a comment out, uh, out on the table before we turn? <laughs> okay, so how do we talk to people in general who do not understand this complicated idea in, uh, in a more simple way? So that's a very good question. Anything else? Anybody else? Yes. Excellent question. Did everybody hear that? Okay. So, um, anything else? Yes. Um, so we, we've heard a lot about the overlay of, of political system in creating race or ethnicity. Uh, I wonder if we could challenge the panel to speak more to some of the economic imperatives, particularly in regards to global capital. Thank you. Okay. So I'll turn to the panel. Answer. <laughs> Your turn, Sylvia. You see why well, I created I, a panel and made myself moderator? <laughs> Let me just say something that I, I don't know if it really is going to answer all of these questions, but it is something that I'm picking up from um, the discussion. Um, and that is, I think it's really important um, to keep in mind that um, there is no logic to race. Um, I have trouble when people talk about racial logics, just like I do when they talk about cultural logics. There, um, and there are no logics to this in the sense of there being some sort of consistent systematic schema by which people are constructing these things. Race, like ethnicity, like capitalism, inequality of all sort, is very ad hoc. So I, I think it's, it, one of the things it's, I might say to my children, I certainly said to my children when they were growing up, which is, well, what do you mean by race? I mean, I ask them, them I turn the question back on them. What are you hearing about it? What are those people saying? And what do you think, why do you think they're saying it? Um, I guess I'm sort of saying, turn your kid into an anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> ask them to be critical about the concepts that other people around them are using. Why are they saying that? Where do you think that comes from? Where do you think they learned that? What do you think the effect is? How do you feel about it? Because otherwise, I think you mm -hmm. end up treating those concepts as if they had a certain kind of reality to them, apart from the dynamics of inequality, power, whatever is going on. And that's what you, you I think you should teach them, is that 
the, you, know, you need to think critically about the kinds of concepts that people are using around you. Any of the rest of you want to address any of the other questions? So what about the question about how do you deal with, uh, how, how do you respond to people who feel that you've taken something away from them w if race or ethnicity has been a source of empowerment for them? Well, let me try to tackle that. Um, I should also say, Cheryl, my kids won't talk to me about race and ethnicity because <laughs> they know what, co what follows is a 20 minute <laughs> lecture. Uh, so they've learned not to ask that question, um, <laughs> sadly. Um, um, you know, wh when people ask me about, you know, is race real? And I said, that's really the wrong question. Uh, and I really, and then it goes back to a, 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 a kind of an old sociological principle uh, that was written back in, I guess, in the late 20s by a um, sociologist named W.I. Thomas, and it's come to be known as the Thomas Theory. And what Thomas wrote, and I'm probably going to botch this, but what Thomas wrote was that if, if men uh, believe something to be real, it will be real in its consequences. Mm -hmm. And so it really doesn't matter whether race is real or not. If people think it's real, then it's going to be consequential, and that's what's really important. Mm -hmm. um, just to pick up on a couple of things. First, in terms of talking to kids, I mean, I think I learn just as much from talking with kids as they might learn about race and ethnicity. So I'm teaching Intro to Chicanex, Latinx Studies right now, which has been renamed for the first time this quarter. Because for our students, it's impossible not to grapple with these issues intersectionally or to think about race, ethnicity, class, gender simultaneously. And so they're pushing many of us for whom we've done Chicana, Chicano, Latina, Latino in certain ways and reinforce certain binaries in ways that for them don't make sense. And they won't let us just perform as though they made sense anymore. And so I think, I, I think there's just as much to be learned from listening as there is from talking to uh, about these kinds of categories. That's, that's one piece. Um, in terms of the economic dimensions that we might explore, one of the issues that I think is really important to emphasize is that insofar as we theorize race and ethnicity in relation to colonialism, we are never not talking about economic issues, right? So race is about the, or coloniality is about the domination of land, labor, resources, bodies, et cetera, ownership of those things. So class is never not on the table when we're talking about race, and I think it's important to emphasize that. Zeus Leonardo, the educational theorist who um, advocates a race, a critical race class analysis, he shows us how it's not just that an analysts of class ignore race, it's that often analysts of race ignore class with powerful consequences such that their theories of change are limited. We want to increase students' acquisition of cultural capital. We want to locate um, young people's funds of knowledge. So we rely on these capitalist metaphors to theorize racial change or racial equality when in fact we would be replicating the very system that is fundamentally co-constituted um, with race. So I think it's an important issue. Can I go back to the question about, because I'm just thinking about, um, what do you say to someone who feels like um, a kind of critical oh, yes. stance on race and ethnicity takes something away from, from them if they, you know, this is socially constructed. I mean, there's obviously Matt's answer, which is, doesn't mean that it isn't real. Um, just as anthropologists treat everything that are the people we study talk about, witchcraft, I mean, it's real in the sense that it has real social consequences, right? But I guess I also think that, um, it's good to add a critical note for someone who um, feels like their ethnic or racial or whatever identity is, has been empowering to them. Um, and I, I think, I can't remember who said it, but um, whether it was an anthropologist or somebody else who said, you know, it's good to feel um, proud of who you are and who your group is, but it's not a good idea to be too proud, hmm. right? So obviously we're dealing with uh, the fact that there is a continuum here and being very, very proud of your racial or ethnic group can, of course, lead to nationalists and supremacists and other kinds of, you know, very nasty um, beliefs and actions. So I think it's important for people to always keep that in mind, that we tend to think of certain forms of pride as <coughs> in negative terms and others in positive terms. But there is a very slippery slope here, and there's a very it's a, continu a continuum that one has to constantly be aware of. So I think it's a good idea to, to um, add a kind of critical note to people's pride in their ethnic or racial group. Mm -hmm. 
And we should probably talk about the stakes of that for marginalized groups versus normative groups and what that pride looks like depending on one's positionality in relation to those sorts of dynamics. I mean, let me answer this question as a Puerto Rican. And if you come to my office, there are some Puerto Rican flags in my office. <laughs> At the same time that I would have to interrogate on whose terms is Puerto Rican is being constructed. It's been constructed in very narrow terms that privilege very specific gender and sexual and class and racial category. Yeah, racial, <laughs> yeah, racial um, sorts of um, um, modes of, of um, or, or positions. So I think that the goal shouldn't necessarily be empowerment, but maybe there has to be an alternative way of understanding what could come out of, say, relating to history in a very different way, understanding oneself as a historical subject in a very different way. Um, and empowerment, I think, often sort of invokes recuperating or showing that one is just the same as some sort of normative category, but that we have to do better than that. That's not what decolonization is about. Any other other comments or questions? Yes. Um, I'm kind of curious about something that one of you had mentioned, I forget, I'm sorry, um, about how um, our certain like disciplines kind of get associated with certain types of racial subjects. Um, so I study uh, so when I came into Stanford, I would introduce myself as somebody who studies Asian American history. And people wouldn't ask me further questions about what that meant. It was kind of like assumed that like, okay, well that means immigration, assimilation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when I started put, presenting myself as a person who does um, the politics of race and ethnicity, then I got more questions. So I'm curious about like, how do we deal with the kinds of assumptions that get laid into our disciplines and the way that we present ourselves as scholars. Um, I mean, is that something that in some ways maybe we need to embrace in terms of like encouraging more of a critical discussion on this, or is this something we need to challenge? Um, I think I was the one who alerted, alluded to that, and what was actually in the back of my mind was today's uh, Stanford report, which it features a lovely interview with our new provost, uh, Drell, versus Drell, and she said that she was reading the blog of a former student of hers who happened to be an African-American woman who, upon entering the Gates building on the engineering quad, was perpetually asked, are you lost? And so I was thinking about that in terms of matter out of place and the ways in which um, you know, again, once in an interview, I was asked um, if I was a hybrid, and I said, well, let me talk to you about Homi Baba's theory of hybridity, um, and the ways in which even something like, you know, FDI, or the kinds of things that, you know, you sort of are what you do in a simple way, um, when in fact, of course, one has been a scholar and learned uh, particular languages and discourses and all of that, and I think so, um, ironically, uh, in the history of that, and this certainly is true for anthropology and ethnography, um, it was white men who were studying the other that both um, Celia and Jonathan were, were referencing, right? So that in some ways, the ways in which some scholarship of race and ethnicity in the academy became legitimized was, it was because it was done by people for whom it was presumed, even though they were studying whiteness in a very difficult way, as I was explaining with eugenics, uh, that they had an objective stance on the topic and therefore um, it could be uh, seen as uh, a kind of legitimate study. Yeah. And so now there is a problem when we conflate diversifying the university with um, the, the diversification of disciplinary subjects and objects, which we should also be doing. But that question of uh, the conflation of that is something that someone who's been in the academy for a long time um, you know, it sometimes still bothers me, and, and I've seen it come up in similar kinds of ways where your knowledge is um, presumed as opposed to understanding, you know, well, what theorists and how do you understand Asian American even, you know, all of those kinds of things. Let me just add that, uh, I mean, this is deeply ingrained in the academy, right? Because the disciplinary formation, certainly of the social sciences coming out of the 19th and 20th century, is rooted in those distinctions, right? Sociology was to be the study of the modern West. <coughs> Anthropology is supposed to be the study of the people left behind, right? So, I mean, that, that distinction has continued. I mean, it, we're still grappling with that in anthropology, although certainly there are a lot of anthropologists now who, as part of a movement in the 70s and 80s, said, wait a minute, are our theories of culture supposed to be only based on the other people? What about white people and people, elites and people with power in places like the United States and Western Europe. So that's changed. 
However, it's still ingrained to some extent in the academy so that when um, universities generally want to have somebody who's going to study the Middle East or Africa or Latin America, they will look to anthropologists when they also in the kinds of theoretical perspectives that are seen to be appropriate for different disciplines. So, I mean, there's a lot of work yet to be done there. Um, and uh, obviously it has carried over to the way in which ethnic studies or Asian American studies or African American studies gets categorized. Yes. Um, yes. Hi, I'm Ala. I'm a second year PhD student in political science. Can you speak louder? up? Mala, Sorry, hi, I'm Ala. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student in political science. Uh, so my question has to do a little bit with politics, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> what I think about on a daily basis. So I think your comment suggests that this, like, this category of whiteness has sort of uh, formed kind of long ago and in relationships with these other categories uh, that were created uh, during sort of like the colonial period uh, and thereafter. And, uh, you know, sort of the media and political commentary these days would lead us to, you know, to, to believe that um, white identity politics has reared its head for the first time, allegedly, uh, in this previous election. And I would love to get a sense from your perspective of kind of the historical uh, role that sort of white identity politics, I'm putting this in quotations, um, has played in, in politics in the US um, and how you think about the, you know, like this sort of narrative that's been put out there by the media and commentators. Sorry for the heavy topic. <laughs> I, I do a lot of work with the United States Census Bureau, and there is nothing more political than that set of categories that appears on that particular form every 10 years. Uh, and, it, it, and, and, and looking at the history of it as it has sort of evolved, I mean, we've asked a race question on the census. Uh, every census this country has ever taken, going all the way back to 1790. Uh, it used to be a category of civil status before we came to understand race as something of biology. And so in the first census, there was, uh, the question was basically whether or not you were free, free or slave. Um, and that was, that was, the, 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 that was the, sort of the object of interest. And then over time, by about 1840, there was a question that was added from uh, mulattoes because there were a sufficient number of mixed race people in this country at that time that they felt like that they had to, to count them. Uh, and it evolves, you know, groups come in, like the groups fall off. And it's, um, uh, it, and it's fundamentally a, pro a political process. So, it, and right now, uh, the Census Bureau is is in the grips of a debate over whether to include a category for what they call the MENA folks, uh, Middle Eastern, North Africa. Uh, historically, if you said that you were Moroccan, uh, and and if you checked your race off as other, then they, they recoded you as white. Uh, and so there's there, that, that, that's been a debate as to whether there are groups that want want the category added. There are groups that, that think the category uh, doesn't belong there. Um, and so you know it is it's it's an intensely political process. And um, and and so and and, and we and, and actually um, um, Lauren Davenport has written you know wonderfully about this. And you know it's. Uh, um, Melissa Nobles is another political scientist who's written about this, and um, you know it's 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 part and parcel, um, uh, part of part of part of our our society and part of our political process as to who who gets put on who gets put on there and who who gets taken off. I guess you know sort of the way I, I think about this is really, you know, and I I'm actually one way. I want to make one comment about you know the connection between race and colonialism because I don't think that's that's necessarily necessarily a, a, a productive way to think about it, or maybe it is, but I like to think about race in somewhat broader terms. And the, reason that, and the thing that got me thinking about this was a few years ago, uh, I don't know if Grant Parker is here, my colleague from Classics, but Grant Parker made me aware of a literature in Classics that deals with racial and ethnic identity in the ancient Mediterranean. And so, you know, it, it predates 1492 by a long time. And then the other thing, the other thought, the other thing I encountered a few years ago too at the same time is I had a group of students collecting census forms from every country in the world that, that, that takes a census. And with a couple of exceptions, every country in the world has a question that has to deal with race. Now sometimes it's framed not as race, but as ethnicity. Sometimes it's framed as nationality uh, or some other sorts of distinctions. 
but they they have these uh, notions of, of of difference, and and it got me to thinking that maybe you know, the way we ought to think about uh, race and ethnicity, and this is why I don't think it, uh, that, that the two are, are separable. One way of thinking about race and ethnicity is to think about the fact that we're animals. And E.O. Wilson published a book some years ago called Sociobiology. It was roundly trashed by lots of people for lots of good reasons, but there was one observation in there that I thought it was useful, and that is vertebrate animals all possess the ability to recognize difference. And the ability to recognize difference probably confers some sort of evolutionary advantage. Or as I say to my students, being able to differentiate friends from foe is the difference between being invited to dinner versus being dinner. <laughs> and that's so, funny. pardon? That's <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but if you think about you know this, this business about difference and the fact that we valence difference, you know, similar, good, different, bad, then the next thing to think about is that there are a set of characteristics that we instantly recognize when we encounter another person. One of them is age, you know, old, young, child, adult, old person. Uh, there is also gender, um, male, female, uh, although that, I, I understand there's sometimes some ambiguity about that. Uh, the always. third, always. always, yes, always, um, and the third would be something about you know physical size and vitality, and then there's a fourth kind of grab bag of characteristics, which have to do with a person's difference or similarity, and if you look at those, we think of those things as race, and they are collections of things about people, the way people speak, or the way they dress the way their appearances in terms of their, their skin color, their bone structure, their hair texture, there's a whole range of these things that we cue on. But the thing that's key is that as you go from one society to another, the things that they will cue on are different. Sometimes it might be skin color, other times hair texture, otherwise other times linguistics. But the process by which we decide which characteristics we're going to think is important and we're going to pay attention to for the purposes of determining difference and similarity are what we think of as racial and ethnic distinctions. And that's a social process. It's historically and spatially uh, specific. And that it, it varies over time, over place. And there's also a certain amount of path dependence that's embraced with it. And so we can find these distinctions of race and ethnicity all around the world, all across history. And they go back to this little biological fact that we understand difference differently and that we like some people because they look like us and we don't like other kinds of people because they don't look like us. Yes. One so thing I want to just say quickly, if I may, is that that question of looking like us um, and recognition, you know, there's all kinds of identifications that's much more complicated than that. Of course, there's more intra-race variation than across race, and we have more similarities. And I think that it is the fact that we, in fact, are similar that the need for difference arises. So I would have a very different way of maybe understanding that in terms of questions of, of power, the arbitrariness, arbitrariness with which um, any of those quote unquote perceived recognitions uh, are, are made which sort of was what you said, but yeah. I, I think yeah, one of I, the things that we have to think about is what the referent for that yes, term who is, we are right? What, what the referent is when, when, uh, when Matt talks about race as simply some sort of difference that we recognize versus the kind of referent that Jonathan and Sylvia are talking about when they're uh, referencing a specific historical <coughs> phenomenon. So, um, Sylvia, I don't know if you want to answer. Uh, yeah, well, about I that? think we're getting at some of some really basic, interesting, and important yes. differences yes. Um, and issues here. Because I guess what I would say in response to Matt is the problem is that when you universalize the concept and in some ways naturalize it by saying that we're all inherently um, able to see differences among people. You make it sound like race, and what I would say is inherently a hierarchical system, um, comes out of people's ability to differentiate among various you know, groups. That, mean, that makes it sound like the categories come first, the recognition of difference comes first, 
And then possibly that gets put into a hierarchy of power and inequality. I would argue the opposite, that it's the hierarchy that came first out of which those categories were constructed. And I think that's extremely, that's a very different point. I'm not saying that this is wrong that people notice difference. I'm saying that the history of race that we're dealing with predominantly, not only in Western Europe and the United States, but throughout the world, is one that came from a hierarchy out of which those concepts were constructed. And that if you take away that imperialist history and that history of inequality and colonial domination and hierarchy, you miss a whole lot of what the actual meaning of and significance of those categories are. I, so it's like gender. You know, some people, for a long time, there's an argument in anthropology about, you know, sex and gender. Yes, sex is just given this biological difference. Gender is the meanings of people attached to it. I think where we've moved now is that, no, no, gender comes first, and the notion of what is biologically given comes second. You have a system of categories that have inherently in them embedded ideas about power inequality and inequality, and part of what happens in the process is an attempt to make those seem like they come out of natural differences of observation. But in fact, there's that history of the bureaucratization of these categories that you've spoken about yourself, right? It's that bureaucratization, it's the history of inequality, it's the relationships that people have in their interactions which are already structured in inequality, uh, on inequality. It's out of that that these categories come. So I just have a hard time with any schema that tries to say, you know, it's something about differences that exist out there. I, I don't think that that's where it comes from. Okay, so it took us a while to get to this point, which is very good. Uh, we're running out of time. I'm going to take a couple of audience comments. Uh, Hazel? I just want to say how useful this very discussion is right now. It seems to me that there's a way that we could um, put them together, putting together the fact that we are biological beings at the same time we are sociocultural, political um, beings. And I think, you know, if we, it's okay to start with, it sounds very fine for me to, as Matt does, to start with the fact that we are social distinction makers, but we, we make those social distinctions with only through the aid of our particular political, economic, historical environment. We, we, we can't do it otherwise. Those distinctions could take any sort of form. I and mean, we could, you know, we could cut up the world in court according to the tall and the short or the blue eyed or the brown eyed or whatever we wanted to do. But once we once we make those distinctions and then there's the path dependence. But I think somehow those are both so important and I, I like Sylvia, you know, the hierarchy's there. You're born into the hierarchy. Those are the categories that you get used, but as beings, we're trying to um, make sense of a world. So I'm trying to think of how we could simplify that and, and foster those understandings so our students could go away with the idea of um, race as a, a doing and a thing done. You know, so powerful and important. OK, I'm going to take a few very short comments, OK? So keep your comments short. Back there. Um, I wanted to say, um, that I was glad to hear Matt becoming a psychologist because that was one voice that was kind of missing from the panel. Um, and like Hazel was saying, I wanted to see how we can bring this together. I think seeing differences is very important, but where does power come from? So if we're trying to struggle which one is first, we also have to ask where does co power come from? And where is the intent? for the power. And I think if we go back to Charles Taylor's book on durable inequality, he was arguing about categorical differences being the base for um, creating durable inequality because groups want to distinguish each other, themselves and other people. And you have to draw the boundary somewhere. And the boundary sometimes changes, but the purpose of the boundary is for people to maintain resources and power within their own group. And who exactly has the power at a certain time, in a certain location, um, in history, in, ge in geographical areas, that depends. But I think that changes. So I wanted to throw that okay, out so, there and see um, what In the red shirt here? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I guess I'm always looking for quote unquote solutions. And, and my, not despair, but a lot, regardless, irregardless of the construction, the history, the definitions of these categories, to me, 
individuals who talk to each other, who try to understand each other as people, often can break down whatever those categories are. And I see a, a society that is more and more segregated, uh, more and more drawing lines between groups, less and less opportunities to spend the time to really learn from each other about what what these things are and how they're op you know, operationalized. So it's just more trying to get into that part of the equation. Okay, so I'm going to go to Rickford and then we'll give the panel one last chance to say. Half the question. Okay. I wonder if the panelists could share with us on your website either the notes that they came into the initiative, should be not one to. If not, at least their references. Yes. Um, I think that would be a useful I really appreciate the comments. That would be very useful to us. So we are recording the session. But I mean, so like, something we do. Okay. Because, you know, sure. you're not going to be able to watch that. Right. I will allow so uh, panel, one want to have a last, I, I, I will just say for myself that I am glad that these di uh, disagreements emerge because they're always there and these are important questions as to, you know, where, what exactly the referent of the words that we're using. I think, um, you know, it took us a while to get to that point of disagreement, but I actually think the answer I, I agree with you that what we ultimately want to do is to be able to um, work with each other, work across difference, but exactly how we got here to this difference and what precisely, uh, you know, uh, capitalism, uh, colonialism had to do with getting us here to help us understand the construction of, you know, white identity politics in the present moment is crucial. So I'm really pleased to have had um, the, the um, statements by our speakers that just got us all thinking and um, you know I really hate to say it but uh, we're, we're just about out of time so um, thank you all for coming thank you.